Hi, I'm Albert, KR3HAB, and this is Halicrafters Rehabs. Welcome back. I wanted to give you an, uh, an update of what's been going on the past four months, and that's basically the shack that's behind me. And man, <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's been a long period of time to get this thing up and running mainly because of the difficulty in getting supplies and all and the pricing and all these things going on uh, during this recovery period of the COVID. And so we really got started in earnest and I guess it was last of April, early May, and I <laughs> did a part one of the framing right at the time when the wood was the most expensive it possibly could be. <clears throat> and that was, um, and then after that, uh, the siding, uh, outer, whatever, covering on the siding was put in and uh, we did everything, but just before the drywall came in, I, I did, a this uh, short video of what it looked like inside. So that's what we'll go to next. As you can see, the framing is finished. The insulation is in. The three drywall inspections are done. There's the exterior door. That's the wrong door that was shipped. <laughs> it has to go back. And we have over here is the box where my antenna leads are going to come through and I'm kind of concerned I'm up to three now. I may have to have a switch that just uses one uh, coax or something like that to get through there because that's only about an inch and half or so ID. It'd be hard to fish a lot of coaxial cables like LMR400 and <laughs> RG8X and all that and plus grounds and everything else uh, through that. So I might just have to use the old AB switch, a remote switch which I have that I can use. All this foil here. Well that's the Faraday cage. And so, right now I have it jerry-rigged, uh, grounded to the eight-foot rod uh, just outside the door. The grounds are not bonded together. This one is just by itself. It's not bonded to other grounds. That will happen later. And then I have this Eton E1, which is I call a noise meter. It definitely would turn this on. So that's There's no real antenna to this. It's just this whip, and that whip doesn't work very well. So, um, so it's about three dB just by this uh, rather imprecise measure is the noise value of the Faraday cage, uh, where 
and it's completed. It's has everything in it. I think I'm going to put in, other than the permanent ground it won't be like that. So I'd say it's a success. Now everything, all the ca all the cables come in. Um, you know, with shielding and the shielding has an RF ground and all that kind of stuff. But even then, I've had trouble with uh, UPSs uh, for the TV just blasting through it, through all of the grounding I've got and and even uh, ferrite beads and everything else. So uh, hopefully this will help some. It was a pretty cheap thing to do and it was available, so I did it. So you see that the uh, uh, the there was a lot of planning that went in to every aspect of this. And uh, I was fortunate to have a, uh, a good uh, general contractor who was very easy to work with. And when you did things in the right times in the windows, it didn't really uh, add that much to the cost. If you, if you have to do rework, then things cost money. So we did everything we could to prevent that from happening. Well, they delivered uh, like 50 uh, sheets of drywall and <laughs> for the to cover this little room and uh, that we were wondering whether the guy was alert that day when he shipped it all out here they had to come pick that up and now the drywall has got in and then it came time to paint and we were going to do the painting so we go to um, Sherwin Williams we need this can and that can and they said well we don't have it well, how about the upgrade? We don't have that either. Uh, there's a truck that comes in at 10 or 30 on sometime around 10 30 on Monday morning. We can see what they have on that. <laughs> Turned out they had a, a only five gallon, a few five gallon uh, can quantities of paint for contractors, uh, nothing for us. So we went to Lowe's and we painted and we were really happy with the the paint job and then uh, Jeff came in and finished out the place and uh, so now it's time to go take a look. Okay here we go. So everything has been <clears throat> moved in including the Christmas tree which I finally have room for and here is my mother's art storage uh, box that we modified and put in and my mother's art table uh, something I'm working on there this is the view inside on a rainy day and so what I did was I put in this uh, Hobby Lobby like uh, picture framing area carpet or the tops of the of the uh, shelf, which is uh, which I really like, and then we have lots of shelves, and even then I had to put uh, keep this one because there's just too much equipment for uh, to put on a, just on a shelf and still have room for the bench, which is over here. It's going up over all of that. And so I've got um, a little $100 uh, VHF UHF transceiver there. And it's uh, feeding a J-pole. And it's really doing a great job getting to the repeater here in Thomasville. Uh, so there's the Halicrafters SX100 that uh, we'll keep me keeping and that's that's the HT 37 that's on the bench after we get things working now 
because there was somebody in the club that basically uh, had too many <laughs> transceivers. But I'm so thankful for that. He uh, gave me this Kenwood, I think it's 7300 or something like that. It's really a portable uh, HF transceiver, and that's what I'm in the process of installing right now. I got the power, it runs off of two Astron power supplies with um, uh, each delivering up to 20 amps each, and so it'll run 40 amps and transmit theoretically up to 200 watts uh, of RF power. So that, that that's the uh, console that, that you mount inside the car, or in this case, inside your shack. And uh, we'll be checking that out pretty soon. Now, Bench got his first break in here. So I was um, turning these things on and this is the voltage uh, indicator and it was it was varying just a little bit like this. It was uh, had a unsteady uh, voltage going on there and finally the fuse blew. So it's time for Albert to learn about uh, high voltage, or not high voltage, but uh, high amperage, 13.8 uh, um, uh, uh, power supplies. And so I took the cover off and they're basically, look at the size of this transformer. This transformer is taking 120 volts and stepping it down to like 20 or something like that. All right, well, I decided not to edit this out because I had something really stupid going on. I had this jumper as a safety measure across the, the main capacitor, which you should always have in place, except when you're operating the equipment. So we'll just try this all again, see what happens. Ooh. 13.8, 22.79, and I think that will settle out a little bit. Just a rock steady. That's what a voltage regulator chip is supposed to do. And of course we have no current, so this is just for test. So, that was funny. First thing that happens is I blow the fuse. Okay, so remember, use these when working with 64 farad capacitors, but don't use them when you're operating the equipment. <laughs> All right, so we'll be putting the cover back on that and powering up later. Now, why did it take four months to get to the point where I'm actually using the transceiver and the and the and the uh, receiver works just fine? It's uh, all going through here. It's a rather complicated jumble. My wife says, "Look at all those wires." <clears throat> well, you've got two antennas. One right now is an in-fed uh, dipole. And we'll show you that in a minute, which is my old shortwave listening antenna, which has been cut down to 133 feet. It was just considered long, random long wire with a nine to one ballon on it, and it worked just fine for listening. But now we have to have things like standing wave ratios that are 1.1 1 .1 in 
And so we have to have resonant antennas. And the 133 feet works pretty good, according to the Nano VNA inside that uh, box there. I get pretty, really good uh, SWR. Uh, without a lot of tuning on this tuner, uh, it, really, it almost isn't necessary. So, um, the other will be the vertical antenna, which is still on order, and there aren't, they can't get tubing and all of that, which you're all well aware of trying to get supplies. I enviously have some more of these uh, MFJ uh, switches that are hard to come by right now. It's hard to come by anything. Uh, toilet paper. Okay. So we're going to go outside for a minute. We can turn this off now. Oh, I wanted to show you this. Okay, I'm going to go put the tripod. You have to see this. So I'll turn this off a second. Okay, so you have to see this. Um, this is that 64 farad capacitor. Like I say, I'm not used to <laughs> working with things this big. Uh, and it's been like two or three minutes, and it's still it, it's only dropped one volt, okay? So, I have a Mr. Carlson's lab design capacitor discharger, okay? And what we're going to do, and he's got, I think it was his Patreon page. It's just a bunch of 50 watt. Uh, or 20 watt resistors and uh, parallel or something like that or, and, res and in series as well to make a safe discharge of, of capacitors. But I'm, so I'm going to run it through this and watch how slow. Okay, here we go. <laughs> We're talking about lots of capacity in a 64 farad electrolytic capacitor. You could probably run it like a battery for a long period of time. I guess people do. I'm going to run it down to 10 and then short it the rest of the way. And then remember to take the short off before <laughs> I turn, put the lid back on and turn it on. Well, you probably don't need to see all that, but that that gives you an idea. Uh, that that is a huge capacitor. Now it's only a uh, rated at 50 volts, which is enough to give you a shock at 50. And I'm sure you uh, 50 volts at this kind of capacity could be uh, uh, pretty dangerous. It's it's actually 22 as it comes out of that capacitor, but still, yeah. Always discharge these things before working on them. And so we're going to go outside and see the rest of this. Okay, so why did it take four months? Well, the reason is because, as you see here, this is the station ground right here. We drove a eight foot rod in here and put one of these plates on and so the lightning protection comes in through here from all antennas before going into the house and including the RF ground which goes back to the shack and this is and we put in this conduit here to go under the sidewalk so that will that gives us the lead to the infed, and when I get the vertical, there'll be another lead that comes through here uh, for the vertical with LMR 400 cable. So, uh, this is the last thing. Nothing could get started until this could get hooked up. Now, I did have some temporary things uh, and so forth, but um, literally, it was like the end of the project is when things start just because of the ground. So that uh, infed 
uh, uh, is over under that tree and it's coming out of the ground to another uh, rod. And I think I'll go over there, but I have to walk around because this uh, soil with the new grass is pretty soggy. Okay, now we're at the end fed. And this is the station, well not the station ground, but the end fed ground. And I have another lightning arrester right here. And it's going up to one-to-one uh, -one common mode uh, filter then to uh, 49 to 1 is get it reduced hard to see in this teeny little picture here there we are then we have a 49 to 1 I think they're called un uns uh, which matches 50 ohms to the high impedance that is at the ends of any dipole you can feed a dipole at any point if you know what the impedance would be on the appropriate frequency and then you would de develop a transformer to do 50 ohms to wherever that is but nobody does it except in specific points because it's just too many calculations so from here it goes out to that tree there for a total of 133 feet approximately because it's very um, I have to climb that tree in order to really get it exact they couldn't do it. And then to that tree that's turned, I don't know if you can see it well, turned into a pole, which is nothing but a hold it out straight uh, position and right next to the vertical antenna pole, which is still waiting for the vertical antenna. So, that, so here's the view out towards uh, the end of the, or oh, where the vertical antenna is, will be, and there'll be some trenching involved because we still haven't had delivery after ordering in June the vertical antenna, and it hasn't come yet. The guys who did the landscaping did a night actually trenched they didn't have to trench they just covered the cable over with the dirt that they were moving around in order to make sure everything drains and so forth uh, and uh, th but they did a nice job so they will I don't have to trench that but this will have to be trenched from this conduit that comes out under the ground here out to that antenna pole so that's where things stand and um, we'll, I'll come back in a minute so I couldn't finish out this video without showing the impact of the movement movement into the new shack on the garage all of the benches along here are gone and it looks more like a garage with garage things in the garage i did keep one bench here for the things for the outside and i kept all of the we'll just say perhaps hazardous materials outside as well but the main thing the most important thing is that I can walk through the garage this way and not this way. Thanks for watching. This is how the crafters react.